Well, hello. How is everyone? I hope you're all well. You're looking amazing, by the way. Absolutely amazing. You must be having a good day. This is video two of two, so if you missed the first one, you might want to go and check it out. Bit of controversy, like we don't have enough controversy around this place. But anyway, this one is just something I've seen. I saw a video done by Get A Clue. And look, I know, I know, not everybody is a fan of Get A Clue, but... Let's just forget about that for a second, because I feel that this information is incredibly, incredibly important. And um, in the link, in the link, the no, the description to this video, there are two links, or one link. I think there's one link, because the, what clue to get a clue? Oh, do you know what? I don't know what I'm doing, what I'm saying. Listen, right, so there will be a link in the description to a video. Go and check that video out. I'll make it easy for you. But this is what this video is about. Now, this is about talking about... Hold on, I might even have it here. I think I've got it. And I can tell you exactly who that video is from. It was from True Crime Overtime with Rosie. And the video that I watched was Get A Clues video talking about this video. So in the description of this video will be the link to that video. Go and watch it. And it's talking about how the argument or confusion over whether this was done by one perpetrator could be put to bed. And I think that is an incredibly important thing to ascertain. Many of us have issues believing that this was done by one perpetrator. One perpetrator. That's the issue that we have. How could one person have gone in here and done this crime in such a speed, such accuracy, such ferocity, got away, and if it was Brian, got away, and seemingly didn't take any evidence out of the house and got away scot-free, apart from a sheaf that looks a little bit suspect in terms of where it was placed and how it was found, so on and so forth. But if the timeline that we are given is correct, then it leaves a time window of approximately... We say 10 minutes, approximately 10 minutes for someone to get out of the car, get to the property, get inside the property, navigate around the property, do what they did, and then get back out, get in the car, and be seen down the road. Now, some people might say, look, that's plenty of time. And look, it might be plenty of time, but there are elements to this that you have to consider, and that is to do with not taking any evidence out of the house, cross-contamination, so on and so forth, if it was Brian Koberg who did it. But this is what we're talking about. This video, what you're going to go and watch after this one, it talks about what Ann Taylor has, hopefully, you would you would hope that Ann Taylor has requested, and that is DNA information from the deceased. Because this person, Rosie, talks about a very, very, um, very good point, and that is that we've not been told about the order with which things happen. We've not been told anything like that. We've speculated on what, how we think this this happened and who was first, who was targeted, who wasn't targeted, and collateral damage, so on and so forth. But what we haven't discussed or what I haven't seen discussed is how you could establish whether it was one person. And the most important thing to understand is if it was one person, then there would be cross-contamination from DNA going across the entire crime scene. Because you imagine, you go into the first room, you attack um, victim number one, so then you have a weapon with victim number one's blood on it. That then goes to victim number two. So you transfer victim number one to victim number two. You then go to victim number three and you transfer victim number one and victim number two onto victim number three and then so on and so forth. If there are any irregularities in that, then you can, you would, cons you would have to consider whether there was two or more people just say that there was no cross-contamination at all between the upper and lower floors but there was contamination across the two on the top and two on the bottom and that would tell you that potentially there was two perpetrators one upstairs and one downstairs and it would be interesting to know if ann taylor has indeed requested that information if there is that information does it exist anymore and if there is that information, then how was that information obtained? Who was involved in the acquisition of said 
um, information and does that information become part of what um, Judge John Judge has recently done an in-camera review of? I, I don't know, but it's just rarely to get your thoughts and feelings on it. You know, has anybody seen anything discussed about this and do you feel that this is indeed what needs to be looked into? And would it be strange if that information doesn't exist, if that isn't navigated within the court setting and isn't discussed? Because that, to me, seems an incredible, incredibly, incredibly important piece of information, if not the most important piece of information to establish whether, if we want to say Brian Koberger did it and convict him of doing it, then he did it on his own then. Or... Let me know down below, you know what I'm saying. But good video by Clue brought our attention to it, and great video by Rosie too. Again, in the description of this video, at the top of that description box, there should be a little icon, like a YouTube icon. Click on it, and that'll take you over to it. And, um, yeah, let me know what you think. Go and watch it, come back, and I shall catch you all tomorrow.